Good morning, everyone. Again, um, sorry, my name is Brittany Hunsinger from the Institute for Public Strategies, and we're really excited to have you here with us this morning for our webinar um, that Meredith is hosting. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to view it later uh, this week. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel, and a link to that will be sent out after this uh, webinar today or tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Meredith. Meredith Gibson is the media director in IPS's San Diego office. She uses the power of geographic information system or GIS and media advocacy to promote systems and policy changes that contribute to healthy, safe, vibrant and equitable communities free from the harms of substance use disorders. She creates maps, web apps, and story maps that are used to advance IPS's own advocacy efforts, as well as those of community coalitions and other nonprofit organizations. She currently leads a multi-agency initiative in designing a geospatial app that will help San Diegans counter the opioid epidemic by directing them to prescription drug drop-off boxes and treatment services. As a featured contributor for GovLoop, an online platform that curates resources to inspire innovation and problem solving in government, Meredith shares her insights about GIS and media advocacy and also presents her GIS and public policy knowledge at conferences, such as the American Public Health Association and Alcohol Policy 19. Before IPS, she was a GIS specialist dispatched to wildfires here in California and Arizona for the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and the US Forest Service. And as a media specialist, Meredith produces news coverage at the local and national levels on topics ranging from substance use disorder prevention to park and green space equity. In 2018, she launched um, our wonderful Speak Well program here at IPS. And it's a series of training workshops that give residents tools on how to advocate for their communities through media advocacy. And when Meredith's not busy writing or creating maps or doing all those wonderful things that I just said, uh, she enjoys spending time with her two boys who teach her everything, literally everything there is to know about the San Diego Padres. So with that, I will hand it over to Meredith. Thank you, Brittany. Appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining me today. I'm really excited about today's webinar because it's basically the manifestation of a vision I had four years ago when I first started at IPS. Um, I was very eager to put my GIS skills to use, and IPS gave me that license to explore this passion of Very um, is basically a soft launch of policy mapping lab here at IPS. And some of you may come from organizations that have a staff person or a team of staff with not to use spatial technology. Sorry, I'll just give us one second. We really apologize for the technical difficulties um, as we get Meredith back on. Just bear with us for just a quick moment. That was unexpected. I apologize. My internet connection is a little unstable. Um, working from home, 
challenges. Um, so let me um, bring up my screen again. And just bear with me. Okay, Brittany, am I good to go with the screen? Yes. Okay, <laughs> you see the presentation again, I apologize. Um, yeah, that's good. Okay, so uh, basically what I'm here is to, to do today is to show you what uh, GIS, this awesome geospatial technology and tool can do with policy maps that um, have helped IPS um, advance our policy advocacy campaigns, but then also to uh, show you how IPS can offer some technical assistance to your organization. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit later in the webinar. So um, at the end of the webinar, I do have a survey um, for you if you wish to fill it out. Um, this survey is really meant to be a um, starter for me to, a conversation starter as a way for me to engage with you if you would like to talk about how your organization can use GIS. Um, you can also uh, check out IPS's other webinars, including ones that have to do with media advocacy, community organizing, and substance use prevention on our website at publicstrategies.org. So let's dive right in. All right, so if your agency is like ours, your objective is to improve health outcomes in the communities that you serve. At IPS, we work to accomplish this through our approach to community transformation or our ACT model. It's a multi-pronged approach that guides our agency's efforts in working with residents, policymakers, and other stakeholders to achieve equitable conditions for all people where all members of society can enjoy the same quality of life. And the components of the model, policy and systems change, community organizing, media advocacy, data and research, and sustainability, they all work in tandem to drive a change in neighborhoods in which they become healthier and safer. And that change could be a policy, for instance, that limits the number of alcohol licenses in a neighborhood or fig figuring out which communities have parks that need improvement or don't have any parks at all. And we'll see examples of how GIS informed these decisions later in the webinar. Uh, the ultimate goal in our approach is to change the community norms in a way that works for everybody. The community norms being those values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that are shared collectively by a group of people with a common geography, such as a neighborhood, a school, or business district, or a community based on an identity, such as gender identity, sexual orientation, or race and ethnicity. So GIS can be used in any of these components of the ACT model to help community champions make evidence-informed decisions. So what is GIS? Just real quick, um, in a nutshell, it's the integration of people, data, and technology to solve place-based problems. And by that, I mean looking at how geography plays a part in the health of a community because place does matter. Um, where a person grows up has a profound influence on their health, education, economic achievement, and even their life expectancy. And we look at geography as an indicator of health because unfair neighborhood conditions, such as unsafe parks, a lack of access to healthy foods, and limited or inadequate health care services can lead to huge disparity in longevity compared to a neighborhood that has more resources that promote a, high, a healthy lifestyle. And according to the Health Inequality Project, people who live in higher income neighborhoods can live 10 to 15 years longer than people in poorer neighborhoods. And when you look at the makeup of these neighborhoods, um, you may find that these um, higher income neighborhoods have more resources that promote a high quality of life, such as parks, healthy food stores, and less exposure to threats to their health, such as industrial contaminants commonly found near uh, low income neighborhoods. As an example, let's look at this slide here. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that about 55% of minorities live within half a mile of a brownfield site, 54% live within a mile, and 48% live within three miles. 
So it is somewhat safe to say that approximately half of communities of color live within proximity as some type of environmental hazard. And what's more, almost a quarter of the entire population that live near a brownfield site are below the poverty level. The graph that I have up on the screen is a very simple illustration of, an, of a GIS analysis um, that was used to determine which populations were most at risk from living near these polluted areas by creating these half mile, one mile, and three mile buffer zones on the map and looking at the demographics underneath it. More sophisticated GIS analyses um, can be used to uncover instances of disease, such as cancer clusters, lead poisoning, or rates of asthma that could possibly be linked back to the surrounding contaminants. So when residents of under-resourced neighborhoods experience unfair conditions such as this, they are obviously more at risk of disease, chronic stress, adverse childhood conditions, substance use disorders, and other challenges to their physical and their mental well-being. So let me return real quick to this slide. What is GIS? What I love about GIS is that it's both an art and a science. And cartography involves creating a map, um, just as a, such as where schools, highways, fire stations, hospitals, where they are located. But GIS is also a science because it helps solve complex problems. It brings together what we call attribute data data such as health, crime, education, and socioeconomic data, and spatial data such as census tract, zip code boundaries, municipal boundaries, and then analyzing all that information to see if we can uncover some type of relationship or pattern underscoring that premise that place does matter. And if you think of it this way, um, attribute data answers the questions about the what or the who, and spatial data answers the question of where. Maps, of course, are the foundation of GIS, but organizations can incorporate those maps into data dashboards, apps, story maps to further give a picture and a narrative of what is going on in their communities. So we can use these GIS tools um, that describe community conditions um, when presenting at a community coalition, for example, um, or engaging the media into covering our stories by giving a comp compelling visual aid, or presenting at a city council or planning commission to support a position when advocating for a certain policy or program. So we actually all use GIS on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you use Google Maps or Waze or Apple Maps or some type of navigation app to get from point A to point B. That is GIS. Um, this is what I would call a general reference map, you, those types of maps, um, the, you know, again, consisting of roads, highways, cities, and other geographic features. Users of GIS in the space that we're talking about here can take that technology a step further by again assigning attribute data to geographic or spatial data. And the result um, reveals conditions such as where inequities exist and how to solve those problems. And these are called policy maps because they create an opportunity to solve place-based problems and advance equity. And just to further clarify, a policy map differs from a general reference map because it does more than show the size, shape, and location of geographic features and the distance between those features. And a policy map, um, to quote Stephen Goldsmith, who is a former mayor of Indianapolis, is a map where the opportunity to intervene is clear. Uh, policy maps help reveal emergency emerging policy questions and approaches to solutions based on evidence rather than emotion. Um, at IPS, everything uh, we do is at somehow evidence-based, it's embedded in data. So the slide that I have up here and, um, discusses some common questions that can be addressed by policy maps. Where are the most socially vulnerable populations? So for example, communities of color are most at risk in terms of health and quality of life. And for example, racial and ethnic minority groups are more likely to get sick and die from COVID-19. I think we've all heard about that lately in the news. Um, also, research shows that alcohol availability and advertising are disproportionately concentrated in racial and ethnic minority communities. 
Also, parks in minority neighborhoods are half the size of parks in white neighborhoods and five times more crowded. GIS can also answer the question, what are the protective and risk factors that can be enhanced or mitigated respectively to promote neighborhood resiliency and sustainability? That's the attribute data and where are they located? This is the geographic data. Uh, policy maps give that geographic reference to these social built and environmental factors that affect our health and well-being. And GIS can also help us answer the question, where can finite resources be allocated most efficiently? Um, so for example, at, I, at IPS, we use GIS mapping uh, it, to inform our Partnerships for Success project. This is a project um, in which we are addressing the upstream factors that lead to substance use disorders with a particular focus on the Latinx population in San Diego South Bay. And by showing the census tracts where child opportunity is low and Latino population is high, this helped us rationalize our focus uh, to our funders on um, why we are focusing on the South Bay region. And also using those maps to engage with stakeholders who have a presence in that region. So to reiterate, policy maps are used to inform decisions. However, some of them are, decision, are decisions that actually create more harm than good. And redlining maps are an example of this. They give us a historical perspective of how place matters and how the legacy of racism and discrimination continues to this day to create disparities in communities of color. Before I dive into this map that's on the screen, um, I'd like to just give everybody a heads up that this part of the webinar presents information that may be uncomfortable uh, for people to hear because of the historical oppression experienced by communities of color and the remnants of race, racial segregation that is still present today. Um, although it is an uncomfortable subject, it's important in understanding its current implications. And I'll explain that in just a minute. So to give just a quick, uh, quick summary and background of this map, um, after the Great Depression, there was a housing boom, which actually drove our economic recovery. The Homeowners Loan Corporation was a New Deal program at that time. And one of the things they had to do was determine which neighborhoods were more at risk of defaulting on mortgages. So they outlined in red these neighborhoods, hence the name redlining. And it turns out that redline neighborhoods tended to be minority neighborhoods, thus leaving many people out from the opportunity to achieve some financial wealth through a key economic indicator, uh, which is home ownership. This interactive map on the screen um, that I have was created by a team from the University of Richmond, um, Virginia Tech, University of Maryland, and Johns Hopkins University. Um, they looked at over 200 large and small cities across the U.S., and they not only provided the, the, the actual maps, redlined maps, but they also gave descriptions that the assessors used um, when describing these neighborhoods. And that, is such, that has such rich qualitative data um, that talks about racial discrimination. Um, so in, when they were redlining these neighborhoods, um, they ranked the, them into four different categories, ranging from A is best, B was still desirable, C was definitely declining, D is hazardous. So I'm gonna compare two neighborhoods for you and I'm gonna go here to Macon, Georgia. And I'm gonna zoom in here and I'm gonna highlight, um, he, Brittany, can you just let me know that it did zoom in, that I'm where I need to be? Yes, it zoomed in. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so I am going to look at B4 here. So B4 is a blue and so neighborhood. So it ranks as a B, which is still desirable. And when we open, click on the census tract, or excuse me, the neighborhood, I wanna read some of this qualitative data here. Negro settlement known as Bertha Dale is about 300 yards east of this area and is far enough removed from B4 to not be a detrimental influence on the area. So that's highly 
vitriolic language in today's terms. Negro settlement far enough removed from B4 to not be a detrimental influence on this area. That's why it ranks as a B, still desirable. But let's move over here to uh, this neighborhood, Pleasant Hill. Um, this area contains best Negro families in the city with result that highest Negro income group resides in the area. Um, there are still white houses on both sides, but the neighborhood was classified as D grade property because of abutting Negro property. So again, this is these are descriptions that the assessors used at the time and how they qualified these neighborhoods. Relatively speaking, um, what I just read to you were kind of mild descriptions compared to language um, used to qualify other neighborhoods um, as an A or a D. Um, they used such derogatory words in these qualitative assessments, such as infiltration, subversive, undesirable, inharmonious, or lower grade populations. So even though, so why are we looking at this today? Um, even though these redlining maps are based on housing policies back in the um, early 20th century, they still have serious implications today. Research shows that neighborhoods that were redlined back then are more vulnerable to climate change, have shorter life expectancies, and continue to be subject to relocation due to highway expansion and transportation projects. That's how the conditions that these neighborhoods are in today. Um, Brittany, if you could uh, kindly put a link to this map in the chat box. Um, if you're interested in exploring what redlining looks like in your city, then a link, um, Brittany is putting it in the chat box. And I invite you to go explore this after the webinar. So, on the next screen, the next map I have um, is a more recent example of maps that will have policy implications for the next decade, redistricting maps. This redrawing of legislative districts is meant to accommodate population shifts and keep districts as equal as, po as possible in population so that communities have equal access to political representation. This in turn shapes the resources and services that will be available to our to our cities. And if you look at the headlines on the left side of your screen, you'll see some ways in which redistricting influences policy making and that the political representation of states are entirely up for grabs. Um, redistricting determines which party has the most influence or leverage among their constituents, and it creates that very controversial um, practice of gerrymandering in which politicians select voters and voters do not elect their politicians. Um, if you'd like to take also a deeper dive into this map, um, Brittany, if you could also put a link to this in the chat box. So now I'm going to demo a couple of maps that we work on specifically at IPS. So the map on this on the screen is an overconcentration map for the binge and underage drinking initiative. Here we map out the density of alcohol licenses because the number, type, and location of alcohol licenses has a significant impact on community residents and businesses. And it's associated with increases in alcohol consumption, which then increases instances of violence, crime, DUI crashes, and other alcohol-related harm. Um, and we've used this and continue to use this map to inform community and city council members of the potential harms of adding more alcohol retailers to a neighborhood. Uh, this map can stand alone or it can serve as the base map for which we can add other data. So for instance, I've also added uh, cannabis dispensaries. So as um, communities, municipalities in San Diego County continue to legalize cannabis and create ordinances around it. Um, we are curious, uh, we are going to want to know um, what is going to happen if neighborhoods become over concentrated with cannabis, to spend, uh, cannabis licenses. Um, we can also add other data, um, such as buffer zones uh, around schools, centers of worship, and community centers to uh, 
demonstrate the proximity of liquor stores to these youth sensitive areas. Um, we could also add police calls for service, locations of other high risk businesses, alcohol related mortality, motor vehicle crash data, and see if there's some sort of correlation to alcohol availability. Again, the purpose of GIS, looking for patterns in relationships. Um, you can also overlay this map with demographic data or other social determinants of health, such as the presence or absence of food deserts or swamps and parts to see if there are any patterns or relationships. Um, an example of when IPS actually did use this over-concentration uh, over map was fairly recently during a recent city council meeting and a follow-up interview with the local radio station. Um, in which BUDI and members of our East County project team used this data from the over-concentration maps to make the point that areas in that part of San Diego County already had too many liquor stores um, to accommodate one more and a license um, was denied by the city council. So depending on um, how you define and then calculate your concentration, we were able to answer um, questions such as, what's the average distance from a person to the nearest liquor store? What's the average distance between the alcohol outlets? Um, you can also get glimpses into how much exposure to alcohol availability and advertising that youth have in these areas. And are there hot spots of crime or DUI crashes in one area compared to another area where there may be fewer uh, liquor stores? And in the future, um, BUDI, uh, Binge and Underage Drink Initiative, as we continue to capture snapshots of community conditions, GIS will enable us to capture temporal data or data related to time to see if any trends change over, over time. This final map I want to show you depicts how much parks are critical to the development of a child and how there are some disparities within the Hispanic population. And just to be clear, this is a generalization of the issue. There could be some confounding issues going on with the data in this map. And it's important that I uh, recognize and acknowledge that. Um, for instance, the parks on this map are not classified by quality. So for instance, there may be a park in a neighborhood, but it may have old and worn out uh, equipment that requires some maintenance. Um, this map, um, the parks in this, uh, on this map also don't distinguish between a, like a small pocket park, for instance, that you find like in the neighborhood versus a large swath of open space. Um, but it's still worthwhile to map out this data um, to give a snapshot of the conditions of a neighborhood. So in this analysis, we looked at the Child Opportunity Index. It takes a measurement of neighborhood resources and conditions that matter for a child's healthy development in terms of education, health, and the environment, and it assigns that census tract a score. So let's look at the legend for a minute. So here we have um, the, the park um, indicated by a tree. And then we have this bivariate symbol here, bivariate meaning two variables. We've combined child opportunity and Hispanic population. So the data on this map, and I'm gonna kind of scroll in a little bit so you can see a little bit better what I'm talking about. Um, it's uh, rendered as a choropleth map. So meaning a certain color palette from light to dark is given to each census tract based on one of the fields in the data. So basically to translate, um, a low op child opportunity score is given a light color of blue and a high child opportunity score is given a darker color of blue. Likewise with the Hispanic population, low, light color of orange is low Hispanic population darker color of orange is higher Hispanic population. So I combine these two variables to create this bivariate symbol here. And so what I'm most interested in is this darker orange here, which represents low child opportunity, high Hispanic population. And I'm also interested in comparing it to areas where there's this color blue here at the bottom of the diamond, which represents high child opportunity and low Hispanic population. 
So if we look at, this is San Diego County, and in this area of blue, according to the legend, it represents high child opportunity. So lots of opportunity for um, child to have a healthy uh, development. And it also represents low Hispanic population. So not as many Hispanics live in this part of San Diego County, relatively speaking. And we also see, I'm going to back it up just a little bit, look at how many parks, the density of parks that are in this blue area. Let's compare that to the south region of San Diego County, where there's this orange area. So according to the legend, there's low child opportunity, not as many opportunities for children to have a healthy development. And there's also a high Hispanic population. And look at the density of parts in this orange area. Just within this area alone, there doesn't appear to be as many parks in this part of San Diego County as there are up in the northern region where um, it was blue, where higher child opportunity, low Hispanic population. So if we click on, let's say, a census tract here, we see it ranks as low in terms of child opportunity. And it gives us what the total population is of that census tract and the percent of the population that is Hispanic or, po or Latino, which is 44%. So we can, um, this is a very dynamic interactive map in which you can look at some of these scores and be able to look at some of that underlying data. This is an important analysis for us to look at because an individual's race or ethnicity and where they live can mean the difference between having good or having poor health. Um, so for example, um, Latinx students in the lower income area of San Diego County um, did not fare as well on the physical fitness test administered by the California Department of Education compared to a Latinx students in the more affluent area of the county. And also not surprisingly, there are more acres of park per thousand people in the north part of San Diego County than in South San Diego County. Furthermore, Hispanic students were almost twice as likely to be overweight or obese than white students in San Diego. And why is this concerning? Other than just from a, you know, from a health and ethical point of view, their obesity costs, the U.S. healthcare system, $147 billion a year, a lot of that cost borne by people with little to no quality health care. We could take this analysis, excuse me, analysis further and look at food deserts or food swamps, um, locations of smoke shops, um, other things that can possibly undermine health. However, we can also look at the protective factors and where they are located rela re, um, related to communities of color, such as community centers, health agencies, farmers markets, safe streets, and sidewalks, and see which ones are there who could help, who we could partner with in helping to um, advance our, um, our program of looking at these upstream um, factors that do undermine health in these areas and see if we can come on board with them and partner with them in our service delivery. But basically the point of this policy map is to see which resources, in this case parks, already exist and which ones are needed to close that health disparity gap in the communities of color. So what I've just shown you in this webinar just barely scratches the surface of what GIS can do. Um, but what we are exploring at IPS are all the different ways that we can use this technology to help solve community problems or work with communities by examining, again, those patterns and relationships between place and health, safety, and longevity. And this is really exciting because we have the opportunity to expand our data and research capabilities and support other elements of the ACT model that we use to create a holistic approach to addressing racial and socioeconomic inequities. 
and community groups and nonprofit organizations um, such as yours can also use this location intelligence to take a deeper dive into understanding your communities or the populations that you serve and then sharing that information um, with your stakeholders through maps, data dashboards, story maps, web apps, policy briefs, whatever, um, whether your audience is um, sort of made up of lay persons such as community members or whether they are funders or whether they are um, policy decision makers. And just as I've been building um, our own organizational GIS capacity, one of the biggest hurdles I have found has just been in finding and cleaning the relevant data and understanding their limitations on analysis. Um, and this can create a huge learning curve that takes time and resources. Fortunately, what I have found is that there has been a big push towards data uh, democratization, uh, making this da data available to organizations such as ours. Um, and it once you have that data, then it becomes, you know, how do you use it as part of an overarching implementation strategy? Um, and this is where IPS comes in. For over 30 years, we have been um, known as implementers. We are really good at kind of bridging that gap between your data collection and then implementation, implementing policies and programs um, to actually move forward. We don't stop with just the data collection. We take it further through our media advocacy, through community organizing, all of those, again, elements of the ACT model. Um, and so I just want to put this out there that IPS is here to help you um, get started by providing technical assistance so that you can move your organization from data collection and analysis to actual implementation of your advocacy campaigns. Um, our, we've been doing this. Um, and different projects throughout the U.S. and in Mexico. And this policy mapping lab that we are you know, launching today is just one way in which we can help other equity-focused organizations do some strategic planning and advance their goals. So I want to invite you to visit our website at publicstrategies.org um, to see uh, how, you know, it, take a look at what we at our offerings of technical assistance and training. Um, if you'd like to have a consultation about how specifically about how your organization can use GIS, then um, please feel free to reach out to me at mgibson um, dot at mgibson at publicstrategies.org or info at publicstrategies.org if that's easier for you to remember. You can also scan this QR code that I have up on the screen and it will take you to, uh, it's a GIS interest form. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a, again, a consultation or conversation starter. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the um, presentation over to Brittany. And just want to say thank you all for joining me today. I'm so excited about this in case you can't tell. Um, and again, just want to thank um, my uh, team of supporters and champions at IPS. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Um, if you can, Nancy did share the, the link to your survey. Thank you. Yep, that's what I was going to ask you. Um, so thank you, Meredith. So before we head into the question and answer portion of today's webinar, we do ask folks to take a minute or two um, to fill out our webinar evaluation. Um, so if you haven't already taken your phone out, please go ahead and take your phone out and you can scan the QR code on the screen. Um, Nancy will also drop in the link to the webinar evaluation. And really, this just helps us, you know, get feedback from you guys, but then also helps us plan for future webinars. Um, so if you have ideas, want to know more, feel free to drop that in the last question. It's always super helpful and it's valuable. So thank you. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a link for the recording will be sent out as well as a link to Meredith's beautiful story map that lives online, um, which is very cool. And so you can explore those maps that she created. It's all interactive and you're able to look at that further. Um, and so those will all be sent out by the end of today. 
Um, and then, of course, if you have any questions or are interested in any technical assistance, as Meredith mentioned, um, feel free to reach out to us at IPS. Um, our website is up on, oh, no, nope, the link to the website is not up there, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but we'll drop that into the chat as well. Um, so yeah, any questions, you can always reach out to any of us or info at publicstrategies.org and we will get back to you. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and open the Q&A and Meredith, I'm sure you can see the chat, but lots of thank yous and great presentation and I definitely agree. So let me just, and if there's any that uh, questions that didn't get answered throughout, feel free to pop them in now. And so let's see, let's go to this first one of, um, so in regards to the place matters slide, Meredith, the numbers decrease as moving away from the brownfield. So does that not include those within the previous buffers? Um, or is it just kind of showing those who live within the buffers? If it you want to go to that. Yeah, let me go to that slide. Um, okay. So um, this came from the EPA. And so what they are saying is that, um, and let me just go back to my notes to make sure I am not saying this incorrectly, because that would be kind of bad. Um, <laughs> sorry. I apologize. Okay, sorry. 55% um, of minorities live within half a mile of a brownfield site. 54% um, live within a mile and 48% live within three miles. So I think what they are saying is that um, as you get further away from a brownfield site, that the, um, maybe I should say it this way, as you get closer to a brownfield site, you're gonna find more minorities that live in that proximity. I think that's probably a better way of saying that. Yeah, definitely. So this next question is, um, looking at this GIS work, how do you involve community members who are most impacted by the inequities? Um, so, so one of the things that IPS and we are very, this is very much a, um, a value that we have is um, working alongside communities. If you like read our mission, that's what we do. And so, um, in, so for instance, I have worked with another um, organization and as we were developing their story or their story map, it was important that I got their perspective, um, their looking at their communities through their lens. And so they, I let them kind of lead the conversation. I ask the questions, but I, and I can make recommendations, but I want to hear from them as to what is important to them, because it may not be the same as what I think is important. They're the ones that are the boots on the ground. So I am not the boots on the ground. I, even at IPS, I rely on uh, my, on a team of people to help inform my work. So to get community members involved in this, there's a number of ways. For instance, like getting them involved in the, uh, just the, the data collection. We have um, data apps that we use in which they can go into the community to do like an environmental scan. Or um, more recently, we are um, working with um, around alcohol policies and kind of assessing restaurants for compliance with um, public health orders, not to, you know, not to be, you know, like, I guess, like tattletales or anything, but to um, make sure that public health is still being, um, is not compromised during pandemic related alcohol um, uh, restrictions being lifted. So there are apps that we use. That if you're familiar with the term crowdsourcing, they're like crowdsourcing apps in a way. Thank you. So for somebody who's new to GIS, are there any resources that you kind of recommend just to like as a starting place? 
if you're interested in the technology, um, so I use Esri ArcGIS. Esri is sort of like the premier software and I'm not here to, you know, I don't get paid by them. I'm not here to you know, be a salesperson for them, but um, it is, um, they, they do make GIS kind of easy, but there are other open source GIS packages out there. And um, even, and I encourage you to look at both. And so um, if you're interested in the technology, so again, Esri is one, uh, QGIS, but if you're interested in sort of the um, principles or ways in which they can be, um, in which GIS can be used, for instance, to like inform your organization, um, Again, I always go to Esri because they have a really good website that um, has a lot of resources and that's very, you know, laid out so well um, as to how you can use their technology. But I do encourage you looking into both open source and um, these more because they can be expensive um, technology. Not for nonprofits. Yeah. <laughs> So we are getting a lot of questions about data. Um, and I know you said, you know, you mentioned kind of the, I forgot the term you used, but like the democratic data or how, you know, it's becoming more widely available. Um, but what are some of the sources that you've used to get the data to compare? Um, uh, somebody mentioned, for example, if they wanted off sale locations of alcohol, outlets um, or parks and schools to kind of show proximity? Is there like a one-stop shop to get addresses or how do you go about doing that? So for the state of California, and I can only attest to California because that's where I'm doing my work, um, the California Department of Alcohol, um, Alcohol Beverage Control, that you can download um, licensed data from their website but it's messy. I'm telling you right now, it's messy because you have to clean it and then you have to geocode it. For those who are in San Diego County, Sanjus, um, which is a service of Sandag, um, our regional, trans uh, regional uh, department, um, they have a very awesome library of GIS data and that alcohol license has already been cleaned and geocoded by Sanjis. Um, that's S-A-N-G-I-S dot org. Um, but I have also pulled um, alcohol license data for like um, our other projects that we have in um, Los Angeles County and San Bernardino counties. And it's there, it's there. And I think that they actually, um, they may even start to have started to provide the file format that you need to pull into a GIS. Um, but if not, then it's available as an Excel file that it has to be clean, like I said, cleaned and geocoded. But this is where, you know, IPS can offer our technical assistance in helping with that. And then is it easy to take that data and input it into, like, to create these maps or? It depends. Um, it depends on the data source. Like I said, there is this push recently to make data more available. And so not just in an Excel or database um, format, but also in um, other types of file formats. So um, it really depends. But like, for instance, the American Community Survey, um, that data, a lot of other data sets have incorporated ACS, American Community Survey, data into those data sets so that, um, and it's by uh, census blog, census track. Um, so that data is super easy to pull into GIS, but then there are other data sets where you have to, you know, again, clean and geocode, but um, it just depends on the data source, truthfully. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the Childhood Opportunity Index and kind of what um, measurements are within that. Um, do you know, I mean, I, I know you are a little bit aware and I know uh, Craig 
has shared these sites, but I'm wondering if you can talk just a little bit to kind of what what makes it, I guess, higher opportunity um, for children. Let's see, I am hitting diversitydatakids.org. And so diversitydatakids.org is where you can go and find more information about Child Opportunity um, Index. It, there are you know, the three main domains, the education, health, and um, what was the other one? But then within those do domains, they uh, look at factors that contribute to the healthy development of a child. And um, they give it a score. And so how I used it, so I'm gonna like pull this up real quick. Um, so I just clicked on this um, census tract here. And so it has a score of 91, which ranks high. You can also, thank you, Craig, social and economic, thank you. Um, so you can also look at how it compares across metro areas and also across state level, uh, across the state. So you can compare, compare for instance, um, San Diego to Sacramento um, and get like that comparative um, basis. Um, or you can just look at it within San Diego. So th there are a lot of these indexes are set up to be compared across um, geographic regions. Um, I hope that answered the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and then we have another question on, um, is it dif how difficult, if it is difficult, is it to take pinpoint data and develop heat maps or percent of concentration? So for a concentration of um, like alcohol license? Alcohol, yeah, let's go with alcohol licenses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, so for in our over alcohol over concentration, this is how we um, have at IPS traditionally calculated over concentration. So it was the number of actual licenses um, compared to the number that the ABC actually authorizes. That's one way of calculating over concentration. There are other ways that are, um, that we're going to actually start looking into that the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, actually advises, which is looking at um, per capita, like number of licenses per capita. Um, that once you get into the GIS system, it's really easy to um, to calculate that and to run those types of analyses. But again, like the the main thing is starting with the data and getting it in the format that you need in order to be able to run these analyses. I would say easily 75% of my time um, doing GIS is spent on data and collecting, finding it, collecting it, cleaning it, geocoding it, um, getting it into a um, format that is usable. And then the rest of it, the the technology is just so powerful, and the um, and there's so many different um, analytical tools that you can use to run your analysis. Awesome, thank you. Um, so speaking of the technology, how does GIS differ from like you know I've heard of like Tableau and Power BI being used, um, Power BI being I think more popular these days. So how does it differ? So I would say that they um, are actually, they're not like uh, competitors of each other, but they are complementary of each other. So um, uh, business intelligence tools such as Tableau and Power BI, they're very good data visualization tools. Um, but with GIS, you're looking at location, um, that being the um, the cards behind your analysis. And you can make good, nice maps in Tableau. Um, you can make nice, um, and you can also do some um, business intelligence stuff within GIS. So like I said, so they're more complementary. I don't use um, Tableau. Um, we have used Tableau in the past. Um, and so it's something that I just need to kind of get 
my arms wrapped around GIS first before I can then go and look at business intelligence. But there are business intelligence tools, like I said, within GIS. Um, it just depends on uh, how you know you want to present your data, nice charts and graphs and stuff, or with maps. Um, but there definitely is that, um, I think, more an analytical um, uh, acumen with GIS. Awesome. Thank you. And so this last question that we have, um, it speaks to the GIS lab. Um, so can you share learning objectives that one could expect to have learned after going through your lab? So before I was inconveniently booted out at the beginning of the webinar, I was um, saying that, you know, the, the people um, who have registered, your GIS knowledge may vary. You could be uh, someone who is in an organization in which there's one person or a team of person that works on GIS or to someone who has absolutely no GIS uh, knowledge or, um, or ability within their organization. And so we want to work with everyone on both sides of the spectrum. So your learning objective would, I guess, kind of depend on where you're already at in your GIS journey. Um, and your you know, current level of knowledge. So, but I would say for someone who um, has, the main thing is what is it that you're trying to achieve in your organization? It's not so much about you know, the, the GIS, the technology and the data, it's how to use it to advance your mission, your strategic um, vision forward so that you are able to, or better able and more efficient more efficiently able to serve your communities. So I just want to be clear on that is that, you know, it's, it's about the end game, which is advancing equity and creating these healthy and safe communities. That's the end game. Perfect, thank you, Meredith. And how do we sign up for the lab? <laughs> We're gonna drop the link again. I think Nancy has already dropped it. Um, to the interest form that Meredith has created. And you can feel free to email us as well, either uh, Meredith directly at ngibson at publicstrategies.org or, or you can email info at publicstrategies.org and we will definitely um, get back to you and see what that looks like. Um, so thank you, Meredith. This was amazing. And I appreciate everyone who came today and joined us. And thank you so much for your your patience and understanding with um, all of the technical difficulties. We prepare and prepare and sometimes technology know. just decides to throw us for a loop. So thank you all. And again, we will be sending out a link to the recording, um, a link to Meredith's story map and all the other wonderful links that we shared with you uh, in our follow-up email later today. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. It's really appreciated. Um, have a great rest of your week and a wonderful day. And thank you, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.